Welcome back. I want to first pause and thank Beth for the gift of time. Um, she sat down with us in her last week at GE. Beth, when you're listening to this, thank you very much. I am so grateful for your time and all the perspectives that you shared in episode one and all the things that we're going to talk about today, such as her perspectives on the future role of the CMO, her social media prowess, uh, introverts, uh, confidence. She's going to be talking about this really cool thing that she's been focusing on for the last year, the Change Makers Book Club. So let's get back to the conversation and let's pick it up on the law of threes. Um, it's an interesting concept she uses to really help identify trends. And what's interesting is I've started to already to identify um, opportunities for you, me to use it in my life. And so we're going to talk to her about how she applies it in her life and how others can use it as well. To me, I guess if there's one thing I feel like I've learned in my career, if there's one word that I feel passionate about discovering, right, and that everyone has to make room to discover what's new and what's next before you're, it hits you in the face or disrupts your business. And so for me, I, I've been in roles where I have to do a lot of pattern recognition, mm. where you're looking to spot trends and see things early. And it's not for some magical power or skills that I've gone to school for, but it's just putting yourself out there. And so to me, it's sort of I, I, my mind. I see something the first time and I go, wow, that's interesting. Yep. It's really Put that in the back of my mind. Yep. Yep. And then the next time I'll see it, maybe it's another industry and not, huh. Isn't that funny? And uh, healthcare and energy are both did being digitized from the consumer. Wow. Third time. Okay. This is a trend. This is really, you can draw a line through it. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a simple mind. It's a simple framework for my head. A mental and model then I go use, back yeah. and I go like, I'm seeing this. I think there's something here. There's a hypothesis. This is going to impact us across industries. Let's look into it. Um, for us, eco-imagination a decade yep. ago was that. We were starting to see more and more industries look for cleaner tech solutions. It wasn't just in the energy space. And so I think companies need people who do that, but I think everybody needs a little bit of that in their uh, in their business life. It's it's our expertise. It's just a simple little device that just reminds you to, to sort of stop and observe. That's what that one does to me. Just stop. Really. Huh. Ask questions. I'm going to quote you. I think this is a quote, but uh, you said traditional companies are now coming to their moment of digital reckoning. And, and obviously GE has been at this for several years. I think you guys have some really interesting stories where it's almost a mashup of kind of the industrial age with the digital age. Mm -hmm. Can you give, when, when we talk about that, may mean absolutely nothing to certain people. Can you give an example or two of what GE has done over the last several yeah, years? Yeah, well, for us, it's really been since about 2010 that we started looking at yeah. these these trends of di the digitization that the internet was having big impact on consumers. What did it mean in the industrial space? And we saw it in energy, healthcare, right. transportation. So what does that, so we've embraced that in a huge way. Uh, invested in our own technology, and it, it basically means embedding sensors and controls into hardware yep. so that they become intelligent. And the data and artificial intelligence gives you insight. So um, to me, the simplest I, way to think about it is imagine if your jet engine, you're flying home, right. tweeted. Okay, it's not really, but it's sending out a signal. It's, a, it's, an, it's an update. It's a message, yep. And it's yep. someone in the service shop gets those messages and like, I'm great, everything's good. But what happened if one of them like, no, it's getting a little hot in here. You know, I need to come in early. You were planning to service me in three weeks. You might want to do it in three days. And so I think it's that insight. And over time, you start to get all the data and analytics that start to come out of the use cases. And people who run companies can run them better. You're able to say, hey, if you're flying a jet engine over the desert versus over the North Pole, there are different factors in different ways. This, this is based on what we see in other fleets, based on what we know from the material properties. All this is, it's not science fiction anymore. It's really happening. It's really happening. Uh, you said something, it was in a speech or an interview where you had kind of compared um, kind of the social connections that have happened over the last 10 or 15 yeah. years. And there's like hundreds of millions or billions. Yeah. And then you said, think about how many connections there are in yeah. machines. And I forget the exact number yeah. you threw out, but it was like, wow never thought about it yeah well that. basically if you look at what what's happened to us as a society i mean we're living it out loud in many ways but three plus billion people connected to the internet on its way to five right. everybody's trying to get everyone connected now imagine when 50 billion with a b <laughs> right. machines get connected and that's the estimate for 2020 and it's 
almost 2018. It's not that far away. It's crazy. And that's what it means. I mean, so if you take industry and you start to put these the digitization, it means your trains move faster. It means it costs a railroad operator less money to operate a train because things get there faster in a hospital. Diagnosis are better. It, it, yeah, you can, it's everything. You can, yep. a, a radiologist can see more by, by comparing the chart to every other every other x-ray that's been done. Um, a, a, a nurse, it takes a nurse 20% of their time to find things that get lost in a hospital setting. That is setting. fascinating, yeah. So now if you can, if it has a sensor and control and even a robot with it, you can summon it. It's those kind of things that um, that uh, I think are, we're going to see change and make industry more productive. That's what we've been betting on. So what about organizations that have been kind of dabbling in this but haven't gotten serious or like are like have finally woken up to the trend but really haven't thought about it, what it means for them strategically? What, what advice would you have for them? Because now they're seven years after GE got into this. What should they be doing? Well, we've not been perfect, yep. and I don't think anyone's been perfect at it. So we certainly haven't been perfect. The race is still on. You've got the digital-first companies. I think realizing it's not just about digitization. Actually, a company that's been in running, air, helping run airlines for 80-plus years probably knows a lot about running an airline right. that we digital team didn't know. So I think we're each going with our expertise. So I actually think the race is on, and I don't think it's too late for anybody. I don't think in certain pieces of it, you know, you've got cloud development and mm -hmm. you've got artificial intelligence. Some of those things are the race is way ahead. Um, so I think every company is going to have this. So the faster you can just create one part of your company that's figuring this out and then figure out how do you spread it to the rest of it. I, w I wish we had started slightly differently or at the same time. I think we've come to this. You have to digitize how you work, not just the things you work with. Yeah. And that was a hard one lesson. So when you say that, are you saying, and, and I think this is where you're going, is we should have thought internally about yes. how we digitize, yes. which I think that's actually a really pragmatic thing that every leader could say is if we're going to go down the path of digitization, did, God, that was not good. digitization, let's think about our organization at the same time. Exactly. I've been working at a lot with um, sales and marketing. And you know, you think, okay, salesforce.com, we get all of our sales folks, we start to have a digital pipeline, we're, we're done. Oh, you're just starting. Right. And you have to digitize every piece of your, uh, your activity. Every function needs to do that. Right. It's not a matter of just saying, oh, now we've got a software system, but you have to work differently. So in, in the case of, of, um, of a salesperson, you're getting much faster feedback loops. Mm -hmm. You're able to say, hey, artificial intelligence is starting to help me think, you know that person I have as a warm lead? Actually, AI can now tell me that person is not an influencer at mm -hmm. all. They have no decision-making power. And so I've spent a year trying to Building win that this relationship. person, yep. and they're never going to buy right. anything. Right. Are you going to, you know, so that can free me up to get focused and more, more um consultative, more spending time with the customers I know want to buy things, know want to solve problems. So all of us, every function, we've got to, we've got to get smarter. Yeah, I almost want to pause because I think there's um, a really important learning. Um, and the reason why that resonates with me so much, I, I actually now lead something called our brand and reputation mm -hmm. venture fund. And the idea was not, hey, here's some cool technology and things that we can bring out to clients. Uh, five years ago, we went on a journey where we said, you know what, we're having reputational issues that are hitting the marketplace. What can we do better to manage this risk? And so we've invested in technology and things like that. It's so much easier to go have a conversation with a client to say, hey, this is something that Deloitte did um, because we needed to from a business perspective. Exactly. And so it's almost the same type of thing. Like if you have lived and breathed digitization, it's much easier to exactly. integrate into your products. And, yeah. You know, okay, I'll buy this product, but I don't know the first thing about how I, <laughs> in a digitized world, and t take if you're in an industry, right? You're an industrial customer right now. You've got to get your chief information officer, your chief technology officer, your supply chain, your sourcing. There are a number of people now have to come together. It's not as simple as, you know, well, I can buy this machine and right. put it in the factory. It's not going to work that way anymore. Right. So let's talk about um, talent, because um, I think there's something that's also interesting happening, which is kind of what is the future of work look like for people. So especially in a digital world, you gotta hire for them, but you also need to develop internally. What's your perspectives, not even just necessarily digitization, but just you know, in all the areas that you've worked in, you know, what are you thinking about the worker of the future? And that could go in so many different ways. It could go to the value of a college degree is being debated now. Um, you know, the fact that people are gonna be probably more subcontracting where you get your talent. 
any thoughts on that? I have I a lot a of big... thoughts. We could spend a whole <laughs> hour could. just talking we'll about our this. Can, exactly. well, can I come back in February? Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I, uh, we, I, I've been part of teams that have looked uh, exhaustively at this. And, you know, it, in some ways it's very exciting to think about the future. Right. Um, the reality is you have to start applying some of that today. Like, right. How do you make today exciting too? It's not, you know, I have a bad job today, so I just can't wait till the future comes. the future comes, comes right. Uh, or it's scary. The, the future can also be very scary to people because right. a, a lot with robotics and artificial intelligence. I think that's the area that fascinates me a lot. I have been big in my career on creativity, judgment, strategy, and I'm really excited that the future is calling for more of that. So you're not worried about what the trends that are out there? I, I'm, I'm worried in the sense, do we have enough people who are going to want to Embrace and it, be yeah. willing and have the skill set to do that? Mm. It's about judgment. Mm. It's not about, it's about strategy. It's, if you want a checklist, if, if you want to run everything just by checklist, there probably ultimately will be a robot that tells that you how do to that. do yep. that. Um, so what you need are the people who know how to deal with things when things go wrong or deal with the unanticipated issues that always happen. And so I worry a little bit uh, in business that we think everything is a process, a Gantt chart, a checklist, and, um, and we're not uh, training, hiring or training for resilience, for judgment, for critical thinking. So that's where I get really, I, I get really passionate about that. We're, we're, so, okay, I'm a, a kid in college. What can they do now to start to develop those skills or is it nature versus nurture like do you think it's stuff that could be taught or is it just who you are? I think it's both I mean I think we've been te we've been encouraging our kids to take code be coders I right. think there's there's value in that just to understand the language uh, you know of, of of the digital world but don't forget about critical thinking and philosophy I didn't take philosophy when I was in college I'm trying to read up on it as much as I can now, now right the critical thinking um, the ethics the unintended consequences if we're gonna start programming our machines to be smart and do things on their own are you thinking through all the unintended consequences of some of this technology you have to think through it what happens if right. how do we do that so I think those things are gonna play a bigger role um, maybe because my daughter majored in philosophy I'm I'm, uh, I'm in <laughs> encouraged by by what I think that kind of thinking is gonna is gonna play forth um, I think the it's adaptability it's the resilience that you're talking about uh, right. how do you I don't know how we hire for it to be honest I mean I think you just need to put people in situations and have them figure it out and see how they and do. And see how they do, right. So there, I guess my fantasy would be that we don't ever accept a job without some kind of test, a trial. I'd love to work for somebody for three months before I made a commitment. I'd it love, goes both ways. I'd love for yeah. the people that I hire to work together for three months so that we can figure out if we're able to solve the problems and have the development we needed. It's not realistic, yet, you know, but I think as we talk about Maybe gig in economy the future is, or right. these, these jobs where people are going to be certified mm -hmm. by taking on certain tasks or challenges and build up an expertise, that becomes more realistic. Yeah, it's funny. When I reflect when I was, um, you know, getting my business degree, it was all about take the most pragmatic classes to get that job. And now, it's almost like you, when I look back, I go, gosh, I wish I took more liberal arts type classes. Because what I find is when I'm sitting down with, even there's somebody young or old, like those that can have a breadth of knowledge that could talk about those things are far more uh, conversationalist and interesting than somebody that just has like a skill that they've built. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of myself again. and I, I um, because I majored in biology and I had a, I would have majored in anthropology if I could have. Right. Um, I guess I could have, but I, um, I love anthropology, but it so has given me a framework for certainly the marketing career I've had and the business career. To me, it's I I go th forward thinking it's less about how cool the technology is, but how does behavior change? Right. So I think all of those things, you know, in, in some ways, biology prepared me incredibly well for business because it's about a system. System, right. And only now in business are we thinking much more systemically because of the digitization and the platform theories and all of these things. It's all about the system. So I have this, I'm going to kind of, well, it's not really changing the subject too much, but it's talking about the analog world. So... I live in, I told you before we started in Walnut Creek, California, we have one of the first Amazon stores, which I just blows me away because last year we shut down another big bookseller. Um, my daughter wants um, a record player, like vinyl record. And and I think what we're find, starting to see is people want physical experiences more and more, but it's once again going on during this digitization that's out there. And I think you even referenced this earlier, but 
How do companies then balance? Is it is it living in that middle that you talked about? I think before? it's living in that middle, yeah. and it means you're going to have to be having one foot in each, and you'll have to find your way forward. What's the right combination? combination. I mean, when you, as you said, when Amazon first announced that they were coming out with bookstores, you're like, are they what? are they punking us? Right. Right, what? Yeah. Um, but they realized they people wanted to actually look at a book. They wanted an experience. And so I think it is that mashup. I think the people who can get that mashup are the physical, digital. Um, and it's also contextual. We're In our lives, we're multidimensional people. We don't want everything to be exactly the same right. all the time. And we have different moods. I think there's a huge segmentation going forward for marketers, for businesses, where it's state of mind. It's contextually relevant at the moment. It's right. not just I'm a woman. It's not just I'm X age. Uh, I'm an American. I'm a North. I'm a you know East Coaster or a Southerner. I think those things are maybe m more analog. Right. And f going forward, it's much less binary. It's much more fluid. We've gotten used to culturally have much more gender fluidity. I think they're going to be much more interest and experience fluidity uh, it's going to be challenging and exciting for certainly business and marketing people you know it's interesting I, I i just love this because what i liked about the amazon bookstore it, they almost use that technology if you like this then you'll like that yeah. they actually that's the way they've organized all their books like they'll have you know kind of an iconic book to the left and then Here's three other books you may like. So yeah. it's really interesting how they brought that in. Meanwhile, I mean, there there's a store here in New York that I'm, I'm a big fan of the founder in the store called Story. Rachel Sheckman started mm. it. And every six weeks, it's like a magazine and a media experience and an and a, and a event every six weeks. She changes out and curates a new experience in retail every six weeks. So it's hard to, it's, it's a hybrid. It's hard. Is it, is it retail? Yeah. Is it media? Yeah. Is it experiential? Yeah. 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 Just three or four different business models. It's just one example. You're seeing more and more of those. Yep. So I think it really is this interesting mashup of things. Um, and so the winners are going to figure those two, the analog and the digital out together. What or how important has all of the diversity of experiences that you've had been in your innovation journey? And you know, we could go through the list, but it's essential, all out there. Essential. essential. And I feel like it's important to point out that um, no one gave me a prescription. Some of these things happened in spite of the job I had or the company I worked what for. What do you mean by that? Meaning, I've had crazy experiences, but I put myself out there for them. I had to open up to them. I mean, G wanted to get into digital more. I, I had to go and be an early explorer and go and meet people who normally wouldn't meet GE, wouldn't right. think GE would be interested in them. And you have to show up on, you know, just different maker communities where people were, you know, hacking things that seemingly G would never be interested in to just understand. And so I think you have to put yourself out there to explore and experience different things. And in companies, we, again, think that's a waste of time. W was that at your own kind of volition? Were you like, I want to engage in this, so I'm going to do it? And what I'm trying to connect it back to is the early comment that you made about kind of internally taking those risks, not taking no for an answer. Um, was it something that you said, this is something I'm interested in, I'm going to go do it? Well, it wasn't my natural um, inclination because I'm more reserved. Right. I uh, And so to kind of put myself out there was a bit of a hard thing for me to do. Right. But my again, I'm curious. I wanted to learn. So I would just, you'd start seeing trends and go, I want to go learn. And, and so that was what I mean. I mean, I you have to, you, you, you're taking a risk of a certain sort. One, that this is valuable to my job, that I can go meet somebody who's, you know, in a hacker space in Brooklyn and that has anything relevant at all to do with GE. It seems absurd. But you bet it does. After a while, you start to understand that there's a whole community of people who are making things. They don't need to be in a big manufacturing facility. Right. You see that the new models of manufacturing are happening, technology. So what you start to realize is that you, you, there are you, the pattern recognition is much uh, richer when you put yourself out there. But, but what would advice... I totally get that. But what advice would you have for people that may say, that's not part of my job? Well, it's not it part of like, anyone's that's job. That's my point. But, but you would just you'd go do it. Because well, you because I think uh, maybe in some ways it, I made it part of my job exactly. in the sense that I had the title of chief marketing officer, right. marketing. But there was, you know, people were like, marketing, you do the ads. No, we don't. Yeah, <laughs> right, we do, we do exactly. that. But that's at the end. You're, you're underestimating what marketing can do when it takes its name seriously, which is live in the market, right? go where change is. So 
I chose I to that. define marketing differently. No one gave me a, a book that said, here are the 10, they did, here are the 10 steps of marketing, but I saw a different opportunity. But I love that because what you're saying is, while there are kind of tried and true ways of doing things, like maybe it's the executive of the future has to live outside of kind of that bubble of, Here's here's the template or here's the uh, the checklist. I think the executive future absolutely has to do that, yeah. and I think they had to challenge themselves just first by saying, looking at your calendar, how much room yeah. am I making for just being out in the world? Is um, this your ten percent rule that I've read yeah, about? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I it's my ten percent rule, which is make room for discovery. Ten percent of my time, and I do much more personally, but in work, I have to go meet new people, find new themes, understand what's happening. Um, you know, you just have to. How do you do So um, I totally agree. Probably one of my biggest challenges, so I'll just relate this to me, um, is the demands on our time are significant. So you have to, I'm guessing part of your answer will be, you have to be extremely thoughtful about where you're spending your time and be proactive. Is that is that part of your I routine? I think that's exactly it. And um, and you also ha can't expect a direct return, immediate an immediate right. return. So you meet somebody, you go to an event, you go explore something. Um, and it may not immediately pay off, but undoubtedly it leads to something else that leads to something else. So again, you have to have a different expectation. I'm going to go here to learn, right? I'm going to go here to experience something new and ask myself, what happens if this enters my world? The digitization, uh, uh, you know, again, I, if I looked at NBC where we were digitizing media yep. and the ability to say this is coming to industry wasn't apparent. But you started to see, hey, people are wearing Fitbits. They're starting to look at their personal health data. Right. Um, wow, this is actually the consumerization of healthcare is actually going to impact how we do healthcare and our customers in hospitals. So you have to be out there to, to see that. Is it implicit in that, though, also the ability um, to learn how to say no, which is like one of the hardest things? Because if you're going to allocate time, that's really an investment for yeah. the future that you don't even know if it's going to pay off. You need to start to learn how to do things that maybe others are asking you to do that, quite frankly. I'm not as good at that. So it is, yes, that is <laughs> so what I... So I'm not going to get any good advice on that That is that what one. I aspire to, but less what I do. Um, but I do think you have to be disciplined. Right. I think that you have to have a, a, you know, a sort of part of your time that's open for whatever happens and then a part that's very focused and you know what your priorities right. are. And um, I've had to I've had to work at that second part. I, I just was I'm reading this book um, that I referenced earlier. I won't call it out right now, but uh, there was this guidance where somebody said, "Rate um, your interest level from one to ten, but you cannot answer at seven. And if you think about it, if you take the seven out, because eight, nine, or ten is like I really want to do that. If it gets to six, it's like eh, it's not important. So I'm going to start. I've always used that's the it's either hell yes or hell no. Because yeah. if you're not, that's a great way of doing yeah. it. But it's not an easy thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel in business, we we think that we, we just surely need to have one more meeting to go through those financials one oh more time. Gosh, yeah. And um, there are times when you need to do that. But how often do we go, let's go explore? I have a hypothesis. Let's go see if it's true. Let's go ask people. Let's go just hang out and watch our customers. Right. Um, instead of let's go try to sell them something, let's just, oh. you know, let's show up with a PowerPoint pitch and 50 minutes later we'll say, you know, how are you? So I think that is a shift that's happening in, in companies. And, and again, a company like Deloitte, you guys, that's, that's what you, you do. I think more of us are starting to come to that um, more consultative relationship and that comes through discovery. It's hanging out with your customers. You know, one of the things that um, I'm actually leading to is how do you disrupt that conversation with the client where you're bringing them a new idea? And one of the things I think we've been guilty, I think a lot of people are guilty, it's like, hey, customer, I've got a point of view, but damn, I'm gonna get through this. Yeah. And, and I think it's more of kind of a journey that you need to go on because you may have some perspectives or ideas, but they may not necessarily conform to what your client's doing or thinking. And so anyways, we're trying yeah. to disrupt that that meeting yeah. that we have. Good luck. I think we all need that. So it'll be a good thing Well, I'll let you know how it goes. We're, we, we're all, we've been there. You sit in that <laughs> meeting and it's like, you look at your watch and it's 55 minutes. And like, I've been there with sales teams I'm part of. And we go, okay, but we really came here to hear from you. We've got five minutes left. We've got left. five minutes what, left. What are your pressing needs? <laughs> yeah. um, or a, a vendor or a potential supplier comes to you and you're like, you didn't ask me one thing about my problem. You, you missed yeah. this huge opportunity. You had an hour with me. You didn't ask me. And to me, the best 
partners, the best suppliers are the ones that know, get to know us better than we know ourselves. I agree. It's well, I think it goes trust. back to that, per, you know, people like to be perfect. Yeah. Like yeah. they want to show that they know everything. So you talked about, I love one of the things, uh, you've given me a lot of good nuggets today, but the whole, um, we need to live in the market. That's what a, yeah. a CMR marketing yeah. does. What do you think the role of the CMO is in the future? I think um, I think it's much more about uh, the customer experience, the customer mm. journey. I think it's sales and marketing together. Um, the, the, that's dog and cats often in yep. any company, right. um, because it used to be you know sales had the customer relationship and maybe marketing sold that you know told helped target at, at right. the uh, to help them target those customers. Now it's much more together. It's it's really marketing. I think is much more in trying to ongoing listen, help bring the changes that are happening in the marketplace back to the customer so they're not surprised by things. So, And then I think the sales piece of it is much more advisory, is much more uh, consultative, much more, um, and, and not, not every company set up for that. So if you were um, <coughs> advising a CMO today to elevate themselves in the C-suite, um, do you have like one piece of advice you'd give to them? Well, I'd give them two. Um, okay. I'm sorry, you only asked for one, but no, I'll no, give you no. Two. You could, you could I, give um, three if you I, like. I just <laughs> say, you know, just up your game on the data feedback. Just become the the owner of the insights. Just really, just mm. parse that, parse that, parse that, and then own the experience interface. It's digital. It's physical. Somebody's got to own that. It, it, that's how you win. And who owns that right now? Who owns it in every company? There's five. So that's can, like one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. So can marketing really help unpack that, uh, at least unpack who should own it? Maybe marketing ultimately doesn't own it, but what are the most essential pieces of the experience and who's best to deliver it? Absolutely. So I always come into these interviews and there's always like a topic that I'm super, like even more interested in learning about and it's social media. Mm. I will say, and this is um, not just because you're here, I don't think I've seen anybody else in the business world do as much as what you're doing from a social media perspective. You're active on, super active on LinkedIn. You have like 735,000 followers, which is amazing. Uh, Twitter, even Facebook you use. Um, when did that become important to you? And what do you do? Because listen, I'll tell you, I get active and then I become deactive. So there's almost like a quality and a quantity component to it. But if you could just reflect on that. Well, uh, for me personally, I think because I came out of media and I'd spent time immersing in digital media at NBC, you know, I lived that life. Right. And so. But others I, have too. I know, but yeah. I, but I think, I think partly it's just, but what I said earlier, if you're going to digitize the way you work, that's a very easy way to digitize the right. way you work. Because what does it do for you? It's not just about chest beating and saying, here's what, I, here's what I'm doing. It's, it's engaging. I find it incredibly effective to engage with employees I work with future employees I want to work with and customers. Right. And people in the early days thought, well, customers aren't on social media. They sure are. Oh, yeah, they are. Yep. Keep their people, right? right. Um, and so I, um, for me, that's been really important. And I find it a good testing ground. I want to test an idea. What do mm. you think? Here's a concept. Um, how do people react to it? So it's my own little laboratory. I love it. It's, so, it's amazing. I was looking again today. I'm like, Holy moly, there's so much content. And you were just, I think I just read this morning before I was just taking one last look. You were in the top 10 influencers. Yeah, LinkedIn had you an like influencer. You like the Canadian prime minister. Yeah, I mean, it was geez. a nice list. It was quite an honor. <laughs> but I um, I also think, you know, look, I have some help because I work in a big company right. and, and I have uh, I, I have help. Um, right. I, as I leave GE and set off to discover what's next for me, I, I'm going to be doing, a, I, I think I'll even have time to do more if, I, if, if it makes sense. I mean, there comes a point where you can, people are like, I don't, I don't want to hear from you. So it's about a discussion, I think, is really what you're trying to do and learn. Can but what learn? you do really well, once again, I feel like I'm pandering to you, but it's true. Um, a lot of content that comes out from leaders feels um, corporate. Mm -hmm. Yours is really authentic. So if you have people helping you, they definitely have your well, voice. Well, what they help me do is just help, you know, I, I I can't post everything exactly the right time every day, right. but I write what I write. Oh, I, I'm very, oh, wow. I'm very, to me, it's very important to have a voice. Right. Um, and I have a certain method that I set up. Usually on weekends, I spend time writing. Um, and, um, and so I think those, are, you have to be, I share things, right? I share failures. Hey, I tried this and it didn't work. So again, if you're looking for perfection, um, and too much of social media, we try to be perfect. So I've tried to take a different tact, which is here, here's what didn't work. What about you? So what was the one 
article post? Is there something that you got so much engagement? Like, I didn't see that coming. Well, I think it's what got me started. It was really early on with LinkedIn. um, And I wrote a piece. It was a first person reflection about working with Jack Welch. And Jack hung up on me because he was telling me that I was too abrupt. And uh, because it was Jack Welch told you that. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Yeah, he was. Here's Mr. Edge and energy. And he was telling me it was too abrupt. But it was the star of the power of Jack as much as anything. And I think it was just me, you know, like I had to overcome something. I had to work on something. And it was also showing Jack used a sense of humor. Um, But I think with social, you need to pick a few platforms that you think are right for you. Um, I, LinkedIn has really been a, a great place for me. I like LinkedIn. I like, I like Twitter for a different reason. To me, it's about discovery. Right. Um, I, I use link, Facebook more because of the live feature. Uh, I haven't quite f- found my groove yet beyond that. My, my book club's on Facebook. But um, So, look, I think you have to you – don't right. – I would say to people – don't feel bad if, if like you're on one platform and not on the other. Do what works for you. Just be a voyeur. Maybe but, but, you don't express yourself. You just use it for in, input and insight. Right, right. But I, I would go back to, I think, um, especially now getting to know you, it's very much you. Like whatever you're putting out there, you believe in. So it gets back to that authenticity piece and the vulnerability. I mean, if the number one article you wrote was about something that Jack Welch said to you. I mean, it's your openness and that's probably why people connected with it. Yeah. Another one that that resonated with me in the past year was a series I did on vagueness and it's that living in the in-between, the vagueness and, you know, because I think we're all struggling with it. So it was a common like, and and the reason I wrote it was because I see with a lot of customers, we're all dealing with this frustration. So in some ways there's a nice cycle to, you see your colleagues dealing with it so you can express it and then you get more people saying, yeah, I'm dealing with this too. So you use a lot of video too. I know I'm getting down into like the nuances of social media, but um, I'm guessing you probably have seen even more engagement through video. Yeah, video, because no one has time to read things. Right. Uh, Video is just, it's like we're talking to one another. Right. Um, You you know, so I think video is just much more urgent and immediate. It's real. You're multidimensional. Absolutely. Um, So I want to go back to um, you talking about yourself being an introvert. And lack, I still can't get over this lacking confidence. Um, Cause that's, you seem like a very confident person. What did you do to overcome it? Or, and you could take this either way, what advice do you have for people who may be introverted and maybe, I don't think you'd like, it's maybe trying to find confidence as a different Yeah, well, I did, and they're different things. I mean, I yeah. think introversion is something um, that I've come to appreciate. And, you know, I mean, it, it used to be something I always had to overcome. Right. And I'd say you have to overcome it if it holds you back. So when did it hold me back? And, and then this is where confidence came in, too. Because I, I'm not the first person to talk in any meeting ever. Um, unless, even now. Even now. I mean, maybe I'm hosting it. But I usually right. sit back, I observe, and then I'll have an observation. But often, earlier in my career, I didn't say anything. And I'd leave that room and I'd be so mad at myself. Like, you know, that person said that. Well, you were thinking that. You thought it 10 minutes before they said it. You missed your chance. Right. You missed your opportunity. Um, so it would be those kind of things of saying, like, I'm holding myself back. I'm not going to be successful. And I have something to contribute. So that would be I needed to overcome that. And so, you know, you just the next time I go to a meeting, okay, I'd write it in advance. I'd plan for it. I'm going to ask this question. And what's my unique perspective? How can I ask that? So it was just it's simple hacks like that is how I force myself to overcome it because I realized business is an extrovert's arena and my natural style was not set up to succeed. So I had to I had to change that. It's that simple. Absolutely. What about, and so now. But hard. <laughs> simple but hard. Because, um, you know, you ask that question and we all have it. And this was a big awakening for me because you, once you open up to ask people. Right. Do you think that way? Be like, oh, yeah, I hated asking that question. I was panicked. You're like, really? You know, you think you're the only one. And so you start to realize, and sometimes say, like, maybe you say to a colleague, I don't like talking in meetings. Can you ask me a question? That's what I think you can do to That's answer the fanta- second part okay. of your question as a, as a team yeah. leader or as a manager of people. If there's someone on your team who's introverted, uh, one, call on them in a different way. Maybe you don't call on them at all and ask them after the meeting if they could give you their thoughts. Or maybe you say to them in advance, you know, I'm going to call on you, so I want you to be ready for an answer. Yep. Uh, I saw people do that for me. Beth, we haven't heard from you. You usually have a good insight. What do you think? So it's almost 
as much the leader's mm. responsibility to a yeah. certain degree as it is the Because they want to hear individual. diverse voices, I hope. Totally. I mean, one of the things I used to lead these, uh, we call them labs at our firm workshops, is I would always be super conscious of who has not spoken. Exactly. Because they probably have some of the best ideas. So I think you're a very intuitive leader and, and, uh, and thinking Thank about you. the diversity <laughs> of, the, yeah. of the team. Because let's face it, we've all heard Cindy 10 right. times, like right. enough of Cindy, right? <laughs> and so by a boss that says, now let's let's hear from Mike, right. you know, Mike's like, thank you. Like, thank you. Yeah, I have, my voice matters. I live on this, I think I'm um, an introvert, but I've had to become an you, extrovert in a weird way. It's funny when I've said more, being more open to saying to people I'm an introvert, I've had, it's amazing how many people who say to me I'm an introvert. Yeah. Um, and so I think um, it, it's our fears sometimes, yeah. right? And so to me, it's come down to like I love the book by Susan Cain, The oh, Quiet. Quiet yeah. I think is really a helpful book. What helped me with that was learning. It's about reserving your energy. You know, it's it's really about sometimes you just you need to hunker in. You need to sort of recharge your batteries. To me, that's the best definition of an introvert. I, I completely agree, and that's where because I do get my energy by being you know by myself, uh, pondering ideas, reading whatever, yeah. and then I could come out expend my energy and then go back into my little But you have to push yourself. I think it can be an excuse if you just go, yeah, I'm an introvert. That's just the way I am. Right. Okay. Well, we're going to accept you for how you are, but this this is the way we do business is everybody contributes and you have to find a way to contribute in a style that that suits you but that delivers what we need do you know what what i've started to use and it's actually been and everybody's talking about it, so i'm not coming up with anything new but is the whole notion of what's the worst that can happen mm. so the people in that's the meeting, like one. what's the worst that can happen yeah that's a good one i lose yeah. my job highly unlikely but that takes Somebody, the confidence right uh, you have to have done that enough to go what's the worst that can happen yeah right i did that and i didn't get fired okay What's the worst that can happen? So you recently, this is kind of all in this uh, self-development uh, realm, but you talked also about recently, I don't remember where I read it, but if there's one thing you would do differently is worry less. Mm. Have you con- like have you figured out no. how to worry less? No. 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 I just, I'm a chronic worrier. I think it's helped me in work because I'm a good scenario planner. Right. I think forward. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, maybe with age and confidence, you know, um, it's usually the, the things that I'm afraid to do. The, the, the things, the new, the new uncharted territories. Like I'm about to set off now and I'm leaving the company I've worked for. I mean, I've been about change, but I've always worked for largely the same company. So that's kind of um, uh, ironic, I guess, and doesn't make sense. I'm about to go off into the unknown, literally now for myself. Right. It's very scary. I'm very fearful of that. I'm worried gonna, a lot about that. What are you going to, what's beyond the book? I've got what a are book. some things I, you're planning? I'm going to take a few months and just, discover just see it's a long time i've asked myself what do you want to do what are you good at how do you want to spend your time so that's what i'm going to ask myself i'm like dying like to ask this question because i've always thought like if i were to i've been at deloitte since 1994 so what now i'm almost in my 24th year i can't believe that um it goes so fast doesn't it it does and what i what i have been thinking is if i ever had that time when i have that time i don't want to know right away because i also wonder like who really am i and I don't mean that, but you know, like, what is it that really would drive me into the next phase of my life? Yeah. And I think people sometimes look to jump to the next thing where they really don't answer that question. I think that's exactly right. And I've done that. You just, you, you take the next thing, not because it's the right thing, but because you think it's, you're supposed to do it. So, exactly. And so now a chance to step back. It's scary. What do you want? I don't know. Don't ask me. Well, who am I going to ask if I don't ask myself? So that's very, it's very scary and uncharted and there's a challenge. I think you'll figure it out. Out. I don't know. That's just my point of view. Um, so you've talked a lot about storytelling. Everybody talks. We have something at Deloitte yeah. called the art of story. And, you know, there's so many Peter Gruber. There's so many people yeah. have written books about it. I still think it's one of those things that's hard for business leaders. And I know I think you've got an opinion on this, but what I'd love to understand is why do you think it's so important? I think that's table stakes. But is there one or two things that leaders can do? in order not necessarily to get better at storytelling, but just start to do it. It's interesting you say that because those, those word, that word storytelling and innovation are two, we, all, we say them and we roll our eyes in companies. Right. But why do we keep saying them? Because we haven't figured them out. Right. Right. So they might be a cliche, but they haven't, they're not yet working in many right. places. So to me, story is to be human. I mean, it's, it's to be relatable. And we think business is only logic. Yet we're people. We bring our emotion. We respond to re- to, to stories that are relevant. Right. Um, we 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 want to know what motivates people. We want to understand what motivates us, and we want to connect. And so, I think business is getting much better about that. I think, um, but I still think it's 
ruled by logic. I think a lot of times though, people think it's got to be some grandiose. We have all maybe back up. We've all heard that eloquent story that somebody tells around the you know the fire, and you're like, "There's no way in a million years I could do that." But I don't think that's what it's about. Yeah. I think it going back to like it's almost like reflecting on your own personal experiences and sharing them in a story based way versus this grandiose story. Right? I think people make more of it than they need to. Yeah, I think they do make more of it. I think you're exactly right. We expect that people to be, you know, we all, we know that person, and we're not. I'm right. not that. Person. I'm not that person. Yeah. But um, I have a point of view. I have a story. I have an insight to share. And so, really, I think it's just sharing a bit of yourself. Right. Right. So. I am going to move into the final questions. Okay. I call them the dessert. I love that just because like, hopefully this is a dessert of this conversation. And I read a, um, a quote that you have, um, which is as follows. I love to read and I believe in the power of books to inspire us, spark our imaginations. And, and I love this word nudge us toward meaningful change. And so I'm not going to ask you, I think it's always a cliche to be like, oh, so Beth, what's your favorite book? Yeah. That's an impossible question Yeah, I don't have question one favorite, answer. yeah. But is there one, and, and the word that you use actually resonated with me, um, and that is nudge, meaning like I think of like something that just maybe pushed you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't or change some behavior or belief. Is there a book that you could say nudged you? Well, I mean, if I were to say back to growing up and, you know, um, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends mm -hmm. and Influence People, is is if I picked one book or a book that I think as a more introverted person um, that had a lot of influence still does. It's it's one of my favorite books. And is it funny to read because it was written in like the fifties or something? So you read it and you're like these stories like the the backdrop, but it's timeless it's advice. Timeless. Yeah. And that's what I like. And then I um I just uh, picked up one this this past month that I've been really interested. In. It's it's by a Norwegian author named Erling Kaga, okay. and he has a book out, uh, it's called Silence in the Age of Noise. So that's my new my new nudge, because here I'm very active in social media, I'm, I'm, I've am i grown up in communications and promotion, so I mean, it's a lot about content and talking right. and noise, and we're in business, and so one of my challenges is to appreciate silence more, and this, this guy writes about uh, going to um, the South Pole totally on his own and no one knowing that he was there and came to appreciate silence. And so that's a nudge for myself of how can I um, start to appreciate more more silence? Um, and I don't always have to be doing busy. Right. I, I was listening to this podcast, and this is like the trendy thing to do, those 10-day meditation retreats, I'm mm. not sure. And I love to listen to people reflect on that because if you want silence, that's like a testament to yeah, what it's like. Yeah, exactly. To yeah, I'm thinking like an hour. I'm not thinking like a week. <laughs> yeah, <so>. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I am super excited to ask you about this change makers program or book club. Yeah. Where did you come up with that? It's such a fascinating idea and thing that you're doing. Well, because I do read, like I have books. If you go to my office, tons of books everywhere. And people would always say, what book are you reading? What book would you recommend? And, um, what I found with my colleagues is, is that they are, I thought, well, you know, this is a way for me to help open up and help do discovery in my company. Let me um, do a talk every month with somebody who's got an interesting book, largely about um, the, about change and innovation. And um, and so I just started doing that. And we did it, we did it on Facebook Live because it was a way to share it across GE right. and with customers. And um, and people seem to like it because oh, it's it's, awesome, a, it's yeah. a discussion with uh, it's applying it to work. So many of these are business books, but it's also applying it earlier mid career people. I think don't maybe don't have this kind of discussion at work. I found people are doing uh, book groups now. They're having like sort of lunch and learns, and they'll use the book and they'll maybe tune in Facebook and we, we replay it. And right. They'll and then they'll use it as a jumping off point for their own book club at work. So I like that that's happening. I think people want to engage around these ideas. What's been the reaction so far? Um, largely really good positive. from that. I mean, I think um, I think that people want access to these ideas and they want to do it with people they work with. And will you continue it? I plan to. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. I just did one uh, last week with Adam Grant. We yep, did it at WeWork, one. which was um, a fun setting. So I'm going to try different locations around and different work settings and try to bring different people into it. It's really about these ideas in the context of work. He's a fat. So I have not read any of his books, mm -hmm. but I was watching some of the videos. Mm -hmm. He's a fascinating guy. Some he of the ideas. Really Oh my gosh! So yeah. yeah, so you got me to probably read his book. Yeah. I think he's got three, right? He's got three, three, three originals. Books. Is is one yeah. of his most recent ones. They're really about creativity and, and disruption of of the people at work. Well, and I think one of the th I don't know if this was it or something else. I do so much research, but is also just kind of um, the patience that you need in germinating these innovative yeah, ideas, exactly. Which we do not have. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't. So. Um, 
So you say you love traveling, but I think I've heard you say, well, where's your favorite place to go? And you'll say, a place I haven't been. Yeah. But if you could go back to one place that you've been, where would you go? I think India. Just India, is really. the yeah. most fascinating place on earth. Just It's so, just huge, just such an intersection of people and humanity and culture. To me, India is a culture living out loud, and I think of it as the most colorful place I've ever oh, been. Absolutely. I used and, to go all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's if you haven't been there, you can't appreciate it. Um, so I think that's a place where I feel like I could go back forever and still not fully discover what India has to offer. Well, you need that book about the, what was it again? The calm and the noise or the one? Yeah, the yeah. silent, silence the silent. and the noise. Yeah. You'll need that in yeah, India exactly. because it's the loudest Yeah, place that would be maybe the ultimate challenge to see if you could have <laughs> find silence in, in, in these cultures where everybody's living out loud. What about um, music? You say you love music. Um, so what do you listen to nowadays? I, I love all music. I, I tend to like more um, alternative rock and, in, okay. you know, um, alter, indie, so really, in, in, more like, <laughs> no, no, yeah, back in the day, but I no, mean, more like it. indie rock, I yeah. guess, you know, sort of more, I'm always like, what's next, kind of uh, like the XX kind of music, you know, right. so, but I, there isn't a music, I, I, I you love, love genres. I love genres, I mean, Led Zeppelin was my like absolute favorite growing up. Still is. If you had me ask one band, I'd have to say Led Zeppelin. Which so. okay. So now, so what's your favorite? That's my favorite band. So um, here, I'll tell you mine while you think. Yeah. Hey, hey, what can you do? Remember that? It's, it yeah. was a B side. Well, I forget what song, but by, by far my favorite. Well, there's a lot. It's like asking your favorite book, and then I'm going to give you my cheesy <laughs> answer, which is my high school girl answer, which is the Stairway to Heaven yeah. answer, unfortunately. But that's the cheesy oh, high school girl in me. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so I, I uh, and you've talked about this throughout the course, but uh, we we purposely talked about, or we purposely named this podcast Resilience. Uh, or resilient. And the reason being is I think that attribute probably more than anything is important nowadays in business. And what I find and what I was seeking was to kind of talk to people who have been resilient throughout their career. So when you think of that word, what do you think of? And is there one person that really epitomizes that in your mind? Well, I think it means to bounce back. I think it just means to, um, t to, to be ready for any possibility. Um, irrespective of the circumstances. Irrespective yeah. of the circumstances. Um, to me, really, it means to bounce back. Yep. And um, I, um, I'm i actually hard-pressed to think of the, the best role model because I actually think in business we haven't um, we haven't given ourselves the permission to say that's what business does. I mean, I think these older companies, I guess right now I'm, I'm really intrigued watching what Walmart's doing right. in the face of huge disrupt. But, you know, presumably they're proving to be really resilient. Um, they've been around a few decades. They're going to be around a few decades more. So I think it's fun to watch companies. I, I wouldn't rule out some of the old companies like the GEs of the world, right? I mean, we've been around for a reason. You know, I'm reading uh, this book I referenced earlier that um, they ask a question, one of your best learnings, and invariably, it's always that thing that knocks somebody on the ground mm -hmm. where they seemingly thought, like, my life's over. I didn't get into that school or I didn't get tenure at this university, whatever it may be, and they say, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. The resiliency soundtrack might be, I think it's Chumbawamba. I get knocked <laughs> yeah, down, but I, I get, get up I get again. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember from the yeah. 80s or 90s. Um, but I think that's what, that to me, that's what it is. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Okay, when we finish this podcast, that, <laughs> I need that music in there. So Chumbawamba. Yeah, I think they, they were a one, a one or two hit wonder. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't, yeah, I don't know their seconds. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, Beth, thank you very thank much. Thank you. This Thanks was a lot. It's really been great talking to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Beth, thank you once again so much for joining Resilient. And thank you, everybody, for listening to Deloitte's Resilient Podcast, produced by our friends at Rivet Radio. You can find us by going to Deloitte.com or visiting your favorite podcatcher, keyword resilient. And if you are enjoying our conversations, share it with your friends and family. Also, please give us a rating. It actually helps people find us. And finally, I love social engagement. So reach out to me. Tell me what you thought of the episode, tell me who I should interview in the future, or just connect with me. I love connecting with people on LinkedIn and Twitter. So if you're going to LinkedIn, Kearney spelled K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. Uh, and then also if you want to find me on Twitter, mkearney33.